So shalom to everyone. <coughs> um, great to see you all here. Uh, for those of you who weren't here, I'll j present myself again. Uh, my name is Aaron Lipkin. I'm an Israeli Jew, um, born and raised in Jerusalem. My father is an American-born Jew uh, from New York. My mother is from Cairo, Egypt. And um, I think that, you know, it's like, I think that, that when you talk about immigrants all over the world, it's always a special story. They bring their culture with them. Uh, but when you talk about Jewish immigrants coming to Israel, that's a different context. It's, 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 a, different, it's a different thing. Um, and, and we need to understand it in a, in a historical context, this is a miracle. The fact that the people that has been in exile for thousands of years uh, in, uh, and all over the world are, are, are coming back to their homeland. And, uh, and, and so when you think about that, you're seeing a, a modern age miracle in front of you. Uh, my wife is half Yemenite, half uh, Moroccan. Uh, Jews, and so everybody gathered to the land of Israel in the last 50, 60, 70 years. And, um, you know, my, my children are asking me, Dad, are we American? Are we, are we Egyptian? Are we, what are we? And I say, you're Israeli. It's, it's, it's already becoming, that we, we're starting to develop our own Israeli identity, and it's, it's really, really exciting. Uh, I just hope we won't lose the food, because I'm telling you, we, if Israel is a culinary miracle as well, um, and, and so, yeah, so if you haven't been to Israel ever, you should really come just for the food. <laughs> you should come. So um, uh, I grew up in Jerusalem and, uh, and went, to the, went to high school, went to the army, married my wife, and, um, you know, we're in the uh, university dorms, and my mother-in-law I understand that my mother-in-law is a very important person in my life. Uh, so she says, Aaron, it's time you stop spending money on rent and start thinking about buying a house. So we're looking around in Israel, and uh, my wife wants to live in Jerusalem near her mother-in-law, but the real estate in Jerusalem is crazy. So uh, we start driving around Jerusalem, and uh, we head to a township north of Jerusalem in the area called Samaria, the Shomron, and uh, we go into my town, and my, my wife immediately falls in love with the place. She says, this is where I want to live. I salute, and, <laughs> and, and we live there. And so we moved there in the year 2000, and uh, we've been there for the past 22 years. But I didn't really realize where I was going to. I mean, I, just, I was just looking for a nice house, a garden, you know, lots of parking, great neighbors. Um, I didn't ac actually realize that, that the area I'm going to is, is really, really important. So one day, I, I jump into my car, and I, drive, and, and, and I drive to the entrance to our town. Now, one of the weird things about Jews living in Judea and Samaria is that they hitchhike. Okay, it's hitchhiking is very common. And, uh, and so every time you go to the town, to the, every time you, you, you exit the town, there is a bus station and, and you have like these probably 10 hitchhikers looking at you like this. <laughs> <laughs> if you pass and you don't stop, you're in big trouble. So, you know, so I, I stop one day and um, enters a, a bearded man. I didn't know who he was. And he's sitting beside me, and we're, we're driving. And we're driving to Jerusalem. This is a half-hour drive. And, um, and after a minute, uh, he says, um, what's your name? So I said, Aaron. He said, uh, you see this, uh, this Arab village? You know, you know what's the name of the, this Arab village? And I said, no. He said, this is the Arab village of Bitin. You know what, what, what Bitin mean, means? And I said, no. He said, well, Bitin is Bethel. Okay, you know what happened in Bethel? And I'm, Beth yeah, of course, Bethel is, is, is where Jacob had the dream of the ladder. It's where, where Jeroboam built the temple. I've been reading these stories all my life, but suddenly I see the place. It's, um, we're passing by it. I'm really excited. I'm continuing drive the drive, and 
suddenly he says, you see the Arab village on your left? And I'm looking, and he says, I said, what is that Arab village? And he says, this is Der Dibuan. Der Dibuan means the monastery or the farm of the two bears. Where do we have two bears in the Bible? Blaisha. So, so, so this scholar, this professor of Bible that was sitting beside me, Professor Yoel Elitzu, is telling me that this Arab village is keeping the tradition that the story of Elisha, who was scuffled by a group of people, um, two bears come out of the forest and kill the people that, that uh, insult the prophet of God. And so this is the Arab village right on to my left. And again, a story I've, I've read, but I suddenly I see the verses falling down and wrapping the mountains. The geography, it's, it's, we continue on. And then he says, you see that shopping mall where you shop every weekend? I said, yes. He said, you see that Arab village beside it? That's Muhmas. You know what happened here? I said, what? He said, Jonathan, the, 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 king, the son of King Saul, fought the Philistine post right in this pass. This is maybe 10 minutes of driving from Ophrah, my town, to Jerusalem, and it just continued on and on. There were th at least three more places that we passed that were, that were biblical. I said, I have to hook up with this guy. He's, he's <laughs> and I bought his book. Uh, the book is titled, A Place in the Weekly Torah Reading. And what it does, basically, it gives an interpretation to each chapter in the Hebrew Scriptures um, but it gives it a, a, a geographical um, look into it. So, you know, when they're talking about a certain place, he's actually talking about the geographical place that it happened and the different things. And, and I read it, and I was, I was just blown away by what he wrote there. But there was something else that he wrote there that really, really blew me away. I mean, I was, remember once jogging around our town, and I saw him, and I said, Professor, were there really tribes in the land of Israel, Israelite tribes, when, when the rest of the Israelites are in Egypt? I was shocked, and he gave me an answer, but I'm not going to tell you what it was, because <laughs> I like to leave question marks. So, um, so I'm going to share with you, uh, we're not going to talk about archaeology this time, we're going to touch archaeology just a bit, but we're going to kind of dive into the scriptures, actually. Um, and I'm going to show you something that uh, is, is, is something I'm researching, actually, in the past few years, and I, hopefully I'm going to write a book about it. Um, but it, it will take, it take, it take some time until I do that. Uh, so I'm going to share my initial thoughts about it. And, you know, you, you guys, I'm sure you love it. And uh, it's going to, to, to give some more depth to our Bible, because the Bible is just endless. It's, the depths of the Bible are amazing. I remember once sitting at work, taking a break and reading my Bible, and one of my managers looked at me, he's a secular Jew, and he looked at me and he said, Aaron, why, you, why do you keep reading the Bible all the time? I mean, it doesn't change. It's the same book all the time. Yes, you know, a regular person reads a book, continues on to read the next book. So I told them, you're right. The book doesn't change. I do. And, and the, the, the more I grow, the, the more un, uh, depth and understanding I have of, of the Bible, of the scriptures. So the, uh, the non-young adults here, I'm sure, will, will also agree with me on that. So let's start with another question mark. It's Friday. And Jews um, um, go to synagogue in the evening to they celebrate the Sabbath. And when we come back from synagogue, um, we come to a to our house, and there's a table, and there's food on the table. And um, before we do anything, the the father and the mother come to their to their children, and didn't work yesterday. It doesn't work now. Um, so I'll have to do this manually again. So uh, the, the father and the mother, they come to the children, 
And uh, we bless our children before we start eating. Uh, we come to each and every child, the boys and the girls. And we come to the girls, and we, we, my wife and I, we put our hands on their heads and we say, may you be like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. And then we say the ironic blessing on the girls. And then we go to the boys and we say uh, the same thing, but instead of Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah, we say, in, uh, in your, uh, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. And I always looked, you know, I, I kind of, I, I like to look at things and try to understand what's going on here because logically the blessing for the, gir the boys should have been, may God make you like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But that's not the blessing. And so I asked myself, why? Why, why, is, why is it that I'm, I'm, I'm blessing my children to be like Ephraim and Manasseh? Also, Ephraim and Manasseh, those tribes, were not the best tribes in the Bible, were they? I mean, they were those that were rebellious, that left, that led the rebellion against the house of David. Uh, you would say that they also led the Israelite northern kingdom in, in idolatry. And, and so, what, what, what's going on? Why in paganism? Wh why, why am I blessing my children to be like them? So let's, let's leave that in the air. But these are two commandments that we have. One is to bless our children to be like Ephraim and Manasseh. This is from Genesis 48.20. This is how Israelites should bless their children. This is what Jacob says. And we have the Aaronic blessing that we spoke about yesterday. And again, I invite you all to watch my teaching about the amazing insight I had about that yesterday. So let's talk about Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, we have a mysterious scene in the book of Genesis where Jacob is about to pass away and he calls Joseph and, and Joseph brings his two children, Ephraim and Manasseh. And uh, Jacob asks them to approach. He crosses his hands on them and uh, basically putting the right hand, which would be on the eldest, on the youngest and the opposite, and he blesses them with that blessing. Now, I always read that, and, and I, I understood that the reason, the main reason for that blessing is that Jacob wanted them to be as the regular tribes. In other words, they were his grandchildren, but Jacob wanted them to be like his children. So you'll have, you know, they, they, they will inherit the land of Israel just as their uncles will inherit the land of Israel. So, so this, is, this is kind of like the, the upgrade, <laughs> family upgrade that they get. Why then is Jacob asking me as, an, as, as his Israelite descendant to bless my children as Ephraim and Manasseh? I think that the answer is, is, uh, lies at the end of my PowerPoint presentation, so bear with me. Um, but let's uh, start with the covenant of the pieces of Abraham, okay? Um, so here we have a prophecy that God appears to Abraham, and he, um, he b basically gives him a forecast of what's going to happen in the future. And in the future, uh, his descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. So God is telling Abraham that his, his descendants will go, we know, well now we know, for, to Egypt, and they will be enslaved there. But then they will come out of Egypt with great possessions. Okay, so we have a prophecy that's foretelling what's going to happen at the Exodus. Uh, by the way, what's not written here? what happens after the Exodus. Mount Sinai, right? It does, uh, the most, one of the most important events that are happening after the Exodus is not being told to Abraham. What happens afterwards? We go in, in the back, we for, fast forward to the future, and Abraham, and we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we just 
talked about Jacob going into Egypt. And we first have a good period in Egypt, and then the, the Israelites are enslaved, and the situation becomes bad. And then we have the Exodus. And we know, we know this story. We've read it many, many times. Now, I have a question for you. Is the Bible a history book? We spoke about it yesterday, right? We have a problem here. If the Bible was a history book, then we would have a clear description of what goes on for 430 years of enslavement in Egypt. But we don't have that. We end the book of Genesis with Jacob. We start the book of, Gen of, of, of Exodus with the enslavement. But there are centuries that the Bible is not talking about. And this is, this is a problem historically. Something happened. What happened? So what do we know? We know that the first period was a good time. Uh, it was favorable Egyptian rule. And then the second period was a bad time. Is that it? Was there a complete disconnect between the Israelites and Canaan? Think about it. The land of Israel was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when Jacob moved to Egypt, we as Bible, Bible believers, Bible readers, we, we tend to be very, is that word dichotomic? We, we, we make these these, you know, sections where we, okay, the Israelites left Israel, they went to Egypt, and then they left Egypt and went to Israel. But was there really a disconnect between the Israelites and Hebron, the, 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 the cave, the tomb of the patriarchs, where their forefathers were buried? Was there a disconnect between the Israelites and the place of sacrifice of Isaac? Was there a disconnect from Rachel's tomb? Was there a disconnect from Shechem, where Jacob b bought the plot of land? Okay, we have a lot of things going on in Canaan. Is it, is, would it be logical to think that the Israelites have totally disconnected from the land of Israel? Is the Bible a history book? We have a gap of 430 years. That's historically unbearable. Almost half a millennia without a historical description. And so therefore, we have to understand that the Bible is not a history book. It's a book that describes real historical events, but it's a, it's a book of faith. It's a book of moral, of providence, of prophecy. And therefore, it doesn't describe all the historical events that happen during the, fri the frame, the, the years that the Bible talks about. Um, it describes only what's important for the biblical narrative. And I'll give you an example. Um, King Josiah a righteous king, dies in a battle fighting Pharaoh, Pharaoh Necho, okay? We hear that Pharaoh comes in, Josiah comes to stop him, and he dies in battle. And this is a traumatic event in the Bible. But why did Pharaoh come into the land of Israel? The Bible doesn't say anything. When we read external sources, we understand that, that Pharaoh from Egypt came into the land of Israel to fight against the rising Babylonian Empire and to help the Assyrians. In other words, there is a world war going on in the Middle East, and the Bible isn't saying anything about it. You understand? If this was a history book, we would have a full description of what's going on, what happened before, what happened afterward, you know, the, 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 uh, how much army did every country have. It's, 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 it's not saying that because the important thing here is Josiah, is King Josiah's death. Uh, and so that's just one, one example. So how can we learn about those 430 years that the Bible describes? What happened then? So surprisingly, we do have a history book in the Bible, and it's called Chronicles, right? Now, this is all the way at the end of the book, Usually, you get tired by the time you get there, so you don't really look at it, and m much of it is just details and details, so you don't dwell inside. But uh, thanks to Professor Yoel Litsur, uh, who I drove with, I started going into Chronicles and reading it, 
And I would like to concentrate on chapter 7 in Chronicles that speaks about Ephraim and Manasseh, those tribes. And uh, I think we're all going to be very surprised at what's written there. Um, and I will add some geographical details to it so it will really blow you away. So, we have the book of Chronicles, chapter 7, and we have the uh, lineage of Ephraim. And uh, we read this, you know, the descendants of Ephraim, Shutelach, Bered his son, Tachat his son, el his son, it just goes on and on. And then we have this interesting clause. Ezer and Eliad were killed by the native-born men of Gat. Okay, now you read this, and you might just browse through it, but what if I tell you that Gat is not in Egypt? Okay, for us, Ephraim and Manasseh are Israelites in Egypt. They operate in Egypt. They live in Egypt. But here, we have a verse saying that the children of Ephraim were killed in Canaan by the men of Gat. Let's continue on. What, they, what were they doing in Canaan when they, were, when, when they were down to seize their livestock? Okay, so we have descendants of Ephraim in Canaan tending to their flocks. Okay, the book of Genesis doesn't say anything about that. This is new information. Let's continue. Their father Ephraim mourned for them many days, and his relatives came to comfort him. Then he made love to his wife again, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. He named him Beriah, because there had been misfortune in his family. And now, this, is like, this really blows me away. His daughter was She'era, who built lower and upper Beit Choron, as well as Uzen She'era. Again, you read this. I read this. I will just browse through it. But when you stop for a second, you ask yourselves, his daughter, the daughter of Ephraim? First of all, she's building towns. Okay? But, but, but there's, there's a problem because this is the, the names, Lower and Upper Bet Choron, are not villages in Egypt. These are well-known geographical sites, settlements, in the land of Israel, just west of Jerusalem. Okay, he, again, we see something that, that totally new for us, that the descendants of Ephraim are not just tending to their flocks in Canaan, they are building cities, they're building towns, they're settling in Canaan. Now, again, let's put this in the frame of the Bible we know, okay? Genesis ends with... Jacob blessing the tribes, blessing Ephraim and Manasseh. Next thing we know, Israelites are enslaved. In this period of time, those 430 years, descendants of Ephraim are going into the land. They're, they're tending their flocks. They're building towns. I don't know about you, but that really surprises me. Now, let's continue. This is, it's just getting better. So... Um, Refach was his son, Reshef his son, Telach his son, Tahan his son, Ladan his son, Amihud his son, Elishama his son, and then we encounter a name we know, Nun his son, and Joshua his son. Joshua be Nun, right? The commander of the Israelites who leads them into the land of Israel. Now, what's, what's interesting, and some Bible scholars raise this possibility, and again, this is a theory, is that this whole story that we're reading here, all this lineage, is actually not happening in Egypt. Okay, this whole story is happening in Canaan, which means that Joshua Binun was born in Canaan. Okay? The Bible doesn't say anything about Joshua being born in Egypt or in Canaan. It doesn't say. But the whole lineage that we see here puts Joshua in the context of the land of Israel. Okay? 
Remind me to talk about Joshua later on because I have a theory that develops that and we we'll, we'll might touch that as well. Let's continue on. Their lands and settlements included Bethel and its surrounding villages, Naaran to the east, Gezer and its villages to the west, and Shechem and its villages all the way to Aya and its villages. And this, this, this clause, uh, this, these verses mentioned the city of Shechem. Okay, remember that as well. Let's look at the uh, geography. So we have the map of Israel. This is the biblical map of Israel. I'm focusing on the tribal map of Ephraim. Uh, and so when we see this, we see that Ephraim was north of Menasseh to the, to the north, was south of Menasseh. Um, and we see all the, the towns that are mentioned, including the city of Shechem, which is, was in the, on the border between uh, the tribe of Manasseh and the tribe of Ephraim. By the way, remember Joshua's altar? Ibal, so that's right, right here on, the, on that border between Ephraim and Manasseh. Let's look at the, those two villages that, that, that She'era, the daughter of Ephraim, built uh, that are today identified as Beit Ur el Fuka and Beit Ur el Tachta, which are today Arab villages on the way from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. Okay, this is, these are real places, real villages that the, 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 the Book of Chronicles describes as towns that were built by the daughter of Ephraim in the land of Israel when the Israelites are in Egypt. Um, let's continue on and, and let's touch archaeology. And so remember about, I spoke about the Manasseh Hill Country Survey Team, group of archaeologists that are walking in the land and are mapping the area um, that, that's worth, that we're talking about, the, the area, now it's working, uh, to the area that, that's here, this area, the Jordan Valley and Samaria. And what they're noticing, remember that influx of semi-nomadic people that now we know that they are Israelites into the land, into the highlands, what you see is that they first concentrate in a certain area on the mountains of Israel, right here. All these dots that you see here are the early settlement towns and, and camps of the Israelites on the mountains. For some reason, the Israelites are concentrating in the area that later on we know is Ephraim and Manasseh, those, those, those tribes, okay? For some reason, they feel comfortable first going inside to those areas and then expanding. That's what the archaeology is telling us. Let's look at another interesting source. Uh, one day, a, an Egyptian farmer plows the land and bumps into something, and uh, he calls people, archaeologists come in, and they find a, a huge city, ancient Egyptian city, called today El Amarna. And the ancient, the ancient city was actually established by a, a very interesting pharaoh called Achenaten. This pharaoh, surprisingly, becomes monotheist. Okay? They, he, he, he abolishes all paganism in Egypt, believes in one god, who he calls Aten, and he builds a new city uh, called, uh, 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 what's the name? Remember the name of the city of uh, Achenaten? It's called, by the Arabs, it's called Amarna. And uh, they dig inside, they excavate, and they find a series of letters that were, that were sent from Canaan to Pharaoh in Egypt. These are called the Amarna letters. And uh, I'm just going to uh, talk about one of those letters. We have a letter from the king of Jerusalem who is in total panic, okay? And he's writing to Pharaoh. He, said, he says that the king of Shechem, remember Shechem? The king of Shechem is aligning with the Chabiru, or the Apiru. And they're taking the land. And the king of Jerusalem is asking Pharaoh to send reinforcements, to send archers to help him guard Jerusalem. So here we have a letter that is talking about the king of Shechem aligning with tribes 
And some sco Bible scholars believe that the name Apiru or Habiru refers to Hebrews or possibly Apiru Ephraim, okay? which kind of comes together with the Chronicles, the, the verses in Chronicles that are talking about Ephraim being in the land, settling, being, building towns. The king of Jerusalem, the Jebusite Jerusalem, is panicking. So, let's summarize. According to the Bible, the verses in the Bible, Ephraim, or parts of the tribe of Ephraim, are already settling the land of Israel, while the majority of the Israelites are in Egypt. Okay? This creates suddenly a complex, a complex uh, picture. Okay? Because we have the Israelites who are going through bondage and slavery, and humiliation, but also through miracles, <coughs> ten plagues, parting of the Red Sea, Mount Sinai. So we ha this is this is we have a complex story here. Okay, let's make it even more complex. Ready? Manasseh. What's the story with Manasseh? So same chapter, Chronicles. We're reading. So, um, we see that uh, the descendants of Manasseh are Asriel. Asriel was his descendant through his Aramean concubine. Okay, I'm stopping for a second. Um, we tend to imagine Manasseh and Ephraim as these real Israelites, just like their uncles. But when we dive deeply into the Torah, into the Hebrew Scriptures, we see that, that, jo that Joseph was an Egyptian prince. Right? I mean, he was Israelite, but he was also an Egyptian prince. His wife, Osnat, was the daughter of Potiphera, the high priest of On. So, in other words, we're talking about Egyptian royalty here. So, Ephraim and Manasseh are not just Israelites, they're also Egyptian royalty. They are Egyptian princesses. How do you say it? Princesses? So, why is this important? It's important because when we read the, this verse, we see that, that Asriel marries an Aramean concubine, and uh, we're going to, 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 to see exactly where Aram is geographically, but this is a, a, what I would call a political marriage. Okay? We have a, an Egyptian prince that's marrying probably an Aramean princess, uh, and so we have a, this interesting connection between Manasseh and the area of Aram. Let's keep that in mind. The next thing we read is that Machir, their, 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 uh, their son, uh, is the father of Gilead. Now, this could mean the father of his son, Gilead. But Bible scholars interpret that verse as the father of the, the towns and the cities of the reg region of Gilead. Now, this is interesting because, again, we see that the second generation after Manasseh, or the third generation, um, is already known to be, to have some geographical connection to the area of Gilead. Okay? What's the area of Gilead? We're going to talk about that momentarily. We continue on. Uh, we have a verse saying another descendant was named Tselophahad, who had only daughters. We know the story. Remember? We know the story of, the, of, the, of one of the Menasites that didn't have boys, and so the, the, the girls wanted to inherit the land as well. So we know this because this is written in the Bible. But the, the rest, the, the, that's, that's a bit problematic. Let's continue on. These were the sons of Gilead, son of Machir, the son of Menasseh, his sister, Adonah gave birth to Ashdod, Abiezer, and Machla. The sons of Shmeida were Achia, Shechem, Liki, and Aniam. So we have a clear connection, not just to the eastern side of the Jordan River, the area of Aram, but also Shechem, the city that we mentioned. Shechem is very, very important. Let's look at the, at the maps for a second. So uh, the tribes that inherited the eastern side of the Jordan River, as we all know, are Reuben, God, and Manasseh. Aram is over here. So the Aramean concubine that it marries the descendant of Manasseh 
comes from this area. And we see that the east tribe of Manasseh inherits this area adjacent to Aram. This is interesting. But let me ask you a question. Which tribes inherited the eastern side of the Jordan River? Reuben, God, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, right? Who asked Moses to inherit the east side of the Jordan? That's a trick question. Remember that the tribes approach Moses and they say, Moses, we want to stay back. Right? Who are these tribes? It's only Reuben and God. Reuben and God come to Moses and they say, we want to stay back. Moses says, I'm angry at you. You're like the spies. You should be coming with us into Canaan. And they say, no, we want to stay here. But I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go first inside into the land of Israel. We're going to be the combat soldiers. And we're not going to come back to our lotsments in the eastern side until we conquer Canaan. And Moses says, okay. And then he gives... Reuben, God, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, their allotments, their, their tribal lands on the eastern side. But the half-tribe of Manasseh didn't ask to be there. Okay? So what's, what's, what's going on here? You see that we have, this is, this is the second weird thing, is that we have Manasseh gets a tribal land on the eastern side, but also a tribal land on the western side. That's the only tribe that gets two separate tribal lands. Another question mark. Let me, rise, let me, let me bring some more question marks into this picture. The Israelites um, are, going, are wandering in the desert for 40 years, and they're coming into the land of Israel, and they battle against Sichon, the Amorite, which is right here in this area. And then, they're right in front of Jericho. Okay, what do, they, what do they need to do? Cross the Jordan and conquer Jericho. What do they do? They go up north and battle against King Og of the Golan Heights for no apparent reason. Okay, instead of just going into Canaan, they're looking for trouble. Why? Another question mark. The Israelites at the plains of Moab, right here, they sin. Okay, they go with the Midianite women, and, uh, and God punishes them. And, and after that, we have a census. Okay, the Bible likes to count the Israelites. So we have two counts, one in Sinai, and one in the plains of Moab. The, tri the numbers of the tribes are the same numbers. There are only two tribes that experience a major change. The tribe of Simeon that, in, 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 that experiences a decrease in the number of Simeonites. Bible scholars believe that that is because of the, the sin of, uh, of the plains of Moab, because the Simeonites were the ones that led the Israelites into sin. And the second tribe that experiences a major change in its number is, surprise, surprise, Manasseh. Manasseh experiences a decrease of 20,000 men to its number. Why? Another question we have, later on in the book of Judges, we hear of a war between Ephraim and Manasseh. There's a civil war going on. The judge... Jephthah, um, who uh, liberates the Israelites from the king of Ammon, um, fights them, and then the Ephra Ephraimites come to fight against Judge Jephthah, and he fights against them, and he puts people on the Jordan River to stop their escape. How, do, how does he check who is a Manasite and who is not? What? With the rocks? The, accent. the accent, very good. He, he asks them to say a word, shibolet. 
If they say Sibolet, their Ephraimite kills them. If they say Shibolet, then they're okay, they can, they can pass. Okay? In other words, the East Menasites have a certain different linguistic attribute to them that makes them different than the others on the Western side. Why? Why did they develop a different language? Are you guys curious? <laughs> now let's connect the dots. Okay, so I'm just, I'm just summarizing. The tribes of Manasseh is granted land on the eastern bank of the Jordan River without asking for it. <coughs> Instead of crossing the Jordan after winning over King Sihon, the Israelites head north and wage war on Og, king of Bashan. Bashan, by the way, is the Golan Heights, the area up here. Okay? By the way, this, the Golan Heights are in the tribal land of the half-tribe of Manasseh. Okay? Um, we have two censuses, Sinai and Moab, and Manasseh grows 20,000 people <coughs> more. We have a different dialect. Let's continue. Another interesting thing that I noticed when I read the, the Bible is in the book of Micah. We have a prophecy, and Micah is asking God to guide the Israelites. And he's saying to them, he's saying to, to, to God, shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, which lives by itself in forest, in fertile pasture lands. And then he wants to give an example of God guiding the Israelites. Okay, now, where does God guide the Israelites? When they come out of Egypt, right? But that's not the first example that Micah uses. Okay, he talks about the early times. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in days long ago. Only after that, as in the days when you came out of Egypt, I will show them my wonders. So we have, what we have here is a, a very ancient memory of a time that preceded the Exodus and is connected to the areas that I just mentioned, Gilead and Bashan. Let's connect the dots. Here's the theory. We understand that during that 430 years that the, Egypt, the Israelite Egyptians, let's call them that way, the Israelite Egyptians, are in Egypt, we have descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh that are living in the west side of the Jordan River and the east side of the Jordan River in two areas. The area of Samaria and the area of Gilead and Bashan. So, how does that explain all the question marks that I have? When the Israelites are coming from Egypt, they're going to the plains of Moab, and suddenly they get an increase of 20,000 people. They didn't come from nowhere. Okay, they joined their Israelite brothers and sisters. Why did the Israelites go up to fight against Og? because they went up to liberate the lands that were already belonging to Manasseh. That is why when Moses gives the tribes their lands on the eastern side, the half-tribe of Manasseh receives his tribal land without asking for it, because it's already his. Okay, so, summarize, we have Israelites, oh my God, 815, we have Israelites, <laughs> we have Israelites living in, the, in Canaan during the time that the Egyptian Israelites are in Egypt, and when the, the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, they're meeting eventually their relatives, their, their, their brethren in the land of Israel. Now, that brings up an interesting question. What is the theology 
of those Israelites. Okay, because we, we know that the, 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 the Egyptian Israelites came out of Egypt, Sinai, we talked about the fire and the, the shofar and the pyrotechnics, and, and they, get, they get commandments, they get feasts, okay? They, they get a whole, a whole list of things they need to do, but their brethren are not there, okay? So what's their theology? Let's just browse through this. Monotheism, you agree? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob believed in one God. Uh, the, their heritage is the story of the patriarchs. Um, their important sites are the patriarch sites, Beersheba, Hebron, Rachel's tomb, Bethel, Shechem, Jabok, Machanaim, Peniel. Circumcision is part of their commandment, not eating the tendon attached to their socket of the hip because Jacob fought against the angel. This all happened prior to Egypt, so that's, that's, that's also the theology of the Israelite Egyptians before they go to Sinai, okay? We have leveret marriage. We learn it from Judah, who has children that they, that there's this whole story there. Um, and um, let's, we'll talk about that later. Anyway, so this is the, what I call the pre-Sinaitic theology. Okay? And then we have Sinai going in. So that brings another question. Why are there three covenants between Egypt and Israel? We have the covenant of Sinai, we have the covenant of the plains of Moab, and we have the covenant of Mount Ebal that we spoke about yesterday. Why do we have three covenants? When you sign an agreement once, that's enough. If you sign an agreement twice and then three times, something is wrong with that <laughs> agreement. <laughs> you understand? So why do we have three covenants, one after the other? I have a theory. Another one. Let's, let's see this. The three covenants. Sinai, Plains of Moab, Mount Ibal. I'm just going to leave it briefly on the screen so you, so you see it. Let's talk about Sinai. So Sinai, we have two groups coming out of Egypt. Which are these groups? The Israelites, the ethnic descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we also have a mixed multitude. What are these mixed multitudes? These are slaves or people that were in Egypt that, know, that were witnessing the miracles that was go were going on in Egypt, and they wanted to become believers in the God of the Israelites. So they're coming out with the Israelites, and they're all convening on Sinai. And God is bringing down the Torah, the commandments, and, and, and all the people that are there, both Israelites and mixed multitudes, say we will do what God says, okay? But what's interesting is that we have a, a, a verse saying that this covenant, I'm, I'm making this covenant with its oath, not only with you who are standing here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God, but also with those who are not here today. Who are these? Okay, so I, I always re read this and I thought to myself, well, he's talking about the future generations, right? But maybe not, or maybe both. Maybe he's talking about people that are not physically there, but are part or should be part of the covenant. Okay, interesting, interesting look into it. Another thing that I want to talk about is um, God speaking to Moses. And this is important. God says to Moses on Mount Horeb, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, El Shaddai. But, I, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. In other words, the Bible says very clearly that God's name appeared as El Shaddai to the patriarchs. That's what the Israelites knew in Egypt. From Mount Horeb, from Mount Sinai on, we have another name, a new name, and that is the name of Hashem, the name that we discussed yesterday that was on that tablet. By the way, for me, the tablet also confirms Mount Sinai, if you think about it. If you look at this verse, the name YHW comes from Sinai. It affirms Sinai. Anyway, so 
the, 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 the the, the Bible says that the, the revelation of Hashem, of YHW, starts at Sinai. This is something that the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh living in the land of Israel are not aware of. This is going on without them being there. So there's a problem. Okay, we have a gap here that needs to be, needs to be closed. Okay, so I need to get a hang of this. So, Sinai. The sons of Israel journeyed for Ramses towards Sukkot, about a half a million men on foot, not counting women and children, and Erev Rav, mixed multitudes, a mixed company that was large, with a long, w went along also with them. And so the covenant of Sinai is bringing together these two groups under one theology. Next covenant is the covenant of Moab, Plains of Moab. And here, uh, I always read this and I thought to myself, the, the covenant of the Plains of Moab is to atone for the sin of the daughters of Midian that we spoke about. Renewing the covenant before entering Canaan and atoning for the Baal or sin. But now that we know that we have two groups joining together, the Menasites, the half-tribe of Manasseh, and the Israelites coming from Egypt, we need to do another covenant and bring Sinai to the Israelites that are from the Manasseh tribe. Okay? So the plains of Moab suddenly makes, an, makes, makes logic. When you have new people coming in, you have to renew the covenant. Okay? And Mount Ibal is the final covenant. Okay? We just talked about it yesterday. But now we have another dimension to it, and that dimension is bringing Sinai to the tribe of Ephraim, okay, on the western side. So we have three covenants that their role is to bring the name of Hashem and His commandments from Sinai to all the Israelites in the land of Israel, both those that came from Egypt and those that were already in the land of Israel. That summarized the ceremony of the blessings and the curses is the most important event in the Bible, it unifies all the different elements of the nation of Israel, and it brings all the different groups under the Sinaitic covenant of the laws of the Lord. So, the question is, sorry, that's a bit of, the question is, why do I bless my children to be like Ephraim and Manasseh? What's the most important thing for Jacob? Jacob is in Canaan, and Joseph calls his father to come down to Egypt and join him. And Jacob is afraid. Why is he afraid? He's afraid because he knows that if he goes down to the land of the Nile, they will not go back to the land of Israel. They will just stay there, they will multiply, enjoy the life in Egypt, and forget about Israel. During the time that Jacob is alive, his grandchildren, Ephraim and Manasseh, are colonizing Canaan. They are keeping the lands that, that are supposed to be the inheritance of the Israelites. So what Jacob is saying to all the Israelites, you should be like Ephraim and Manasseh. You should not forget your connection to the land of your inheritance. Thank you. said it would be chewy. <laughs> <laughs> you never fail to. Uh, <laughs> wow. You're marinating. Wow. You got to marinate in a lot of this, right? Um, okay, let's do this. Um, Aaron. You, <laughs> no, I'm John. <laughs> Pastor John. You, you just call me John. Okay. Um, Let's do this. Uh, you plan to stick around for a little bit? Sure. Oh, okay. Um, so let's take a break. Uh, I know you still have some DVDs and some books out there. Um, so if, if you're interested, I know some people who weren't here last night were asking, and so they're still for sale. Um, 
We're going to come back in 10 minutes, 15, something like that, for some Q&A. I know the young adults are heading over to the cafe, if that's what they want to do. Um, but uh, then we're going to come back uh, for Q&A. I've, I've been getting questions all day long from people, and I'm like, well, come on and ask the question. Don't, don't expect me to ask you all the questions. But um, So if you have questions relevant to this or anything that you, know, that you want to ask, be prepared. Come on back for that. Uh, we're not going to go to O Dark Thirty uh, like we did last night, but uh, still, we're going to we're going to ask some questions. So, take a break. It's eight twenty six. Be back in fifteen minutes, which is eight forty one. Right? I'll see you then. So, all right. Um, I'm sure people have questions. Certainly, questions from last night. Um, uh, I'm, I can't imagine how you don't have questions from tonight. Um, so, and I, uh, I want to give everybody an opportunity, and you probably have something you'd like to begin with. Right. But before you do, mm. um, so I have a question that someone asked me this morning. I, I was, it was emailed, and so I, I have to ask it. Um, and I think it's really um, twofold. So, and it's not related to what you've done tonight. Yeah, well, in one sense it actually mm. is, uh, because it still deals with uh, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So uh, in Joshua 22, we see this altar, this other altar that's uh, built. And I think you and I discussed this on our, our last time together in Israel. Um, and the first question that was asked to me was whether that has been found. And I said, I don't, I don't know if there's any basis for thinking that it has been found. But uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, first of all, has it been found? Any idea whether it's been found? Uh, no, the altar wasn't found. Okay. Uh, Joshua 22? No. Uh, what are your thoughts about, do you think that altar may be a replica of what, you've, what you found on Mount Eva? Wow. It would seem that it would be, since it's a replica. Uh, well, it doesn't say replica. But it, this is a ceremony, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that's taking place at Shechem, right? At Shechem? At Shechem. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, uh, 22.10, when they came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh built oh, a great you're altar. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I got mixed up with the ceremony of Joshua at the end of the book of Joshua. Oh, oh, oh 24. Okay, yeah. okay. So, so you're talking about, the, so the, the, the story is the following, just to remind you, um, the, 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 the tribes of the east, Reuben, Gad, and half-tribe of Manasseh, they returned to their, to their tribal lands in the east after fighting, and before they, they, they crossed the Jordan, they built an altar um, on the west side of the Jordan, and then they continue on to their tribal land. And then the story is that Phineas, the high priest, uh, is, hears that they established what, what seems to be a replacement theology altar uh, to the central sacrificial place in Shiloh. So um, now Phineas is, is not a nice guy, okay? I mean, if you look at, at Phineas and where he appears in the Bible, it's always civil war. It's like this guy, you know, he shish kebabs. Yeah. You better walk right around this dude. <laughs> uh, he shish kebabs the, uh, the guy with the Midianites of the plains of Moab. He, um, he f when, when they fight against the tribe of Benjamin uh, in the book of uh, Judges, of judges, um, he he declares civil war against Benjamin. Okay, this guy is a real zealot, and so when he j hears that there is a, a, a this altar that that's being built there, he immediately reacts. Immediately, so um, uh, he sends a, a, an envoy to these these tribes, and he says, well, "What what's going on? What's this tribe? That, what's this altar that you did?" And they tell him, whoa, 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 this is not an altar, okay? This is just some kind of a memorial uh, to show the Israelites on the west side that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord, is also the God of the tribes on the east. That's what it is, okay? Don't worry. And Phineas is content, and he leaves. Mm -hmm. This is what the Bible says, right? right. Yep. Now, I'm verifying. <laughs> now, <laughs> fact-checking you. <laughs> Remember, uh, this is not fake news. 
So, <laughs> so rem rem now, remember, remember when I spoke yesterday about the footprint structures? OK. So one of those footprint structures is the footprint structure of Argaman, which is probably the huge, mo the biggest structure um, that, of, of the six. And we visited it yeah. together. Yeah. And uh, this structure um, is right at the Jaybok Pass, the closest to the Jaybok Pass mm. of the footprint structures. And interestingly, inside of it, there is a, a round, um, let's say, you could call it an altar or a high ground. Um, and we excavated it three years ago. And what we did was we entered into the, the inside of the, this round structure. And it was, it, we found cooking pots. Now, these cooking pots are, are, um, are Israelite. They're, they're, they're late bronze, early Iron Age. But what was, inter what was interesting is that we just found cooking pots. Hmm. OK? Now, why is, that, why is that important? It's important because, apparently, sacrifices were not held there. You understand? This was, this was essentially a picnic place. It was a holy picnic, but it was a, it was it was but it was a picnic, and so some some scholars believe that this is the the exactly what the tribes of the east are saying. We're not going to be sacrificing mm. here. We're just hold we're just holding we're, we're doing ceremonies here to commemorate our connection to the Lord. We're not sacrificing. Okay, so it's interesting to see the possible connection between the archaeology and what the tribes are saying in the Bible. So I don't know if I, did I answer your question. So, yeah. so it has been found. Yes. Well, maybe. Or, or something, maybe. It, it would appear that right. it has. Right. Because they say, you know, this is not an altar for a sacrifice. Right. This is to be a witness. Right. Um, and by the way, Adam Zertal also proposed that that footprint structure is the memorial that the, the tribes erect. Huh. Uh, so maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Oh, so oh and one, th one more thing, Come sorry. Yeah. Uh, w in the Bible, it says that they, they, uh, they erect the altar at a place called Gelilot. Okay? Now, yeah, it inter where? the interesting thing is that Gelilot is um, also mentioned in another place in the Bible, the, the, the border between Benjamin and Judah. There is a, a spot called Gelilot. Now, when you, this is, Gelilot appears in the tribal borders of Judah, but when you read about the tribal borders of Benjamin, that same spot is called Gilgal. Ah. So Gelilot and Gilgal uh -huh. apparently are the same thing. And therefore, if Adam Zertal is correct, the footprint of Argaman is the same Gilgal or Gelilot that those tribes uh -huh. erect. Interesting. Yeah. Do you understand what I said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So there you go. Uh, and I'm sure there are questions. So, who'd like to go? So wait, before first? before, before a question, oh, yeah, we have the lady. Yeah. We had a lady that came up here, and she had to go. But she asked, right. why is it that these specific tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, are the ones that that inhabited the land of Israel, uh, uh, or part parts of them were already in Israel? And so the the theory is, this is the theory of Professor Yola Litzur, um, is that when Jacob um, is about to die, he asks Joseph to vow that he will bury Jacob in the tomb of the patriarchs. And the question is, why does Jacob do that? Why is he asking Joseph to vow? Why just not say, when I'm dead, bury me in Canaan? And so the Bible, uh, the sages say that the reason why Jacob did that is because the custom in Egypt was that Egypt is the best country. That's, the, uh, that's where you live, that's where you die, that's where you're buried. And, and so dying and being buried outside of Egypt is an insult to Egypt. And so when Jacob makes Pharaoh vow, makes Joseph vow, he basically doesn't give Joseph any other option. And he actually gives him a good excuse. So when Jacob passes away, Joseph goes to Pharaoh and asks his permission and says, I don't have any choice, I vowed. And so the idea is that you, you do not leave Egypt. Who can leave Egypt? Army, soldiers, occupation, 
That's, that's mm -hmm. something that's, that's okay, that's possible. Now when we talk about Menasseh and Ephraim, and we say that they're Israelite, but they're also Egyptian royalty, uh, you, Professor Yorali Tzul believes that they were Egyptian generals. They were part of the Egyptian army, and they were allowed to occupy or to conquer Canaan in the name of Egypt. That was their excuse. Do you understand? So the rest of the tribes, they're Israelite, they're locked in. But Ephraim and Manasseh are mobile. They can do whatever they want. One of the things we chatted about briefly up here is, and I'll just sort of say it and we'll go on, but, um, you know, in America, what do we have? 246 years, 248 years, which seems like a long time, but we're pretty young. Um, you know, when you talk about Israel, even, you know, the, uh, the Micah, verse that you had up here before is from roughly 700 BC. Um, looking back to a time, 1400 BC, they're looking back in their own history, 700 years. But that was, I mean, we're, we're talking the, the exodus or the entry into the land was 3400 years ago from our perspective. So when we read the Bible, and in one sense this is just stating the obvious, and I can be kept in the obvious a lot, but I, I I have to remind myself often when I'm reading that I'm just going from verse to verse to chapter to chapter and moving through. And sometimes you can just read one chapter and move to the next one and you could have moved 100 years. There's a lot that happens in there. And um, if we're not careful, you know, this is it's one of those things I want to be careful how I say it. We, we love the word of God. But, and, and this is part of the reason that, I, you know, I love you because you're a nice guy, but I, I respect you because you're lovingly challenging, not the word of God, but how we interpret right. some things and, and fail to look between the lines right. and between the letters even sometimes to recognize there's a whole lot happening. Here. Right. Things are cooking. I mean, the, and, and again, the example of you know, King Josiah and Pharaoh Necho and what was happening, the world war, you know, that's, a, that's an apt you know, description of what was happening. We miss those things. We don't think about it. We say, okay, I got the story. I'll move on to the next story. But it's not just a story. It's history. It was really happening. Right. Now there's a principle the Holy Spirit wants us to understand but it's not wrong to ask, but what really was happening in there? Right. And I think the, the more we'll do that sometime, um, the far more color we start to add. Totally. To and, I, and, I, and I think that the, the important thing to remember is as long as it doesn't contradict yeah. Yeah. the Torah exactly. or distort it, we're good to go. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say that uh, I think that we're going to be discussing this and not letting anyone ask questions, but you know, we're enjoying ourselves, so who cares? If they um, want to watch, they can. I think that, that uh, what you said about Micah is very interesting. Uh, and I mentioned it to Pastor John that uh, when we read the book of Judges, we hear about a, a mysterious feast in mm. Shiloh uh, where uh, you have the ladies of Shiloh going out to the vineyards to dance. Remember the story of the concubine in the book of Judges. So there is a feast of the Lord in Shiloh where women go out and dance in the vineyards. Okay? According to the uh, tradition, the Jewish tradition, this is a a feast called the 15th of the month of Av. Okay? This is not commanded in Sinai. This is not part of the, uh, the, the commandments in Sinai. So we have a, a, a holiday here that is agricultural, a holiday that is that the women dance um, in the vineyards. Where does it come from? What's its origin? Okay? It's called the Feast of the Lord, not less. Okay? It's, it's an important... So... Um, but it's not one of but it, the seven feasts right, of the exactly, Lord. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so again, the, I'm not going to go into it, but it, the idea is that it's part of the, the holidays of the Israelite, native Israelite tribes that were in the land of Israel. Um, this is a whole... A whole s and this is another story, but what I wanted to say is that this holiday is called Chag Adonai Miyemim Yemima, the Feast of the Lord, of ancient times, or that repeats itself from, from, from year to year, but it's, it's ancient. That's, that's the idea. So when Micah speaks about the ancient days in the Gilead and Bashan, there is, there is this, I think that as in the head of the Israelites, there is a, a, a thing called the good old days. 
Okay, mm-hmm. the, in the good old days, or the good old days of Bashan and Gilead, and that, that's that's kind of like the spirit that that I I feel when I read those verses. And so every time you hear about the good old days, that's the time of Manasseh and Ephraim in the land of Israel. So, okay. now I want to ask questions. So, same rule, questions, and I'll, I'll kind of repeat it for anybody who didn't hear it, but also so that it gets on the, uh, the video. Eric. So my frame of reference is linear. Jacob and his family went to Egypt because there was famine. But there are a lot of other Israelites There were other people that just stayed there. So not all of Israel went to Egypt. Well, that's a little tough. So no 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 so yeah. So so let's 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 uh, let's make a clear distinction between the Okay, wait, the, the, so everybody okay, I don't know what people heard or not. Yeah. So Eric's saying so are are we saying that uh, you know Jacob and his family went to Egypt because of the famine, but there were other Israelites who didn't go. They stayed in Canaan. Right. So let's let's okay. We're just speculating here. This is not a verse in the Bible, but um, what we see when we read the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is that we have the direct descendants of the forefathers. We have a, cr- a clear lineage through which inheritance goes through. In other words, Ishmael is not part of that inheritance. Esau is not part of that inheritance. It goes through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's descendants. And so that's the clear, that's, that's the ethnic group called the Israelites. When we talk about the patriarchs, we see that there is another group that, that, that goes along with the patriarchs, uh, the, people, the, the people of the tent of Abraham. You know, when Abraham goes to fight against, against the, the, the kings, he has 400, uh, I believe it's 400 uh, uh, people of his of his house of his tent that are not his descendants, but they are people who believe in monotheism. They they believe in God in Abraham's vision of one God, and so the idea is that through the ages you had other peoples that were not part of the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That that uh, when we get to Jacob, they they might have gone to Egypt with them or stayed in in the in Canaan to keep the family real estate, so to say. So um, again, we're, we're just theorizing here. The interesting thing is that when we go, when we go to Mount Ebal, and, and, I, and I quoted those verses yesterday, we see that the people that attended Mount Ebal were the foreigners and the native-born. Okay, Who are the foreigners? Who are the native-born? This is, this, is in, this is in Joshua 8. Okay. So, um, and, and we also see that the, the king of Shechem, the king of Shechem, is aligning himself with Ephraim, or the Hebrews, according to the Amarna letters. Why is that? Well, the Bible is very clear about that. Jacob made a pact with Shechem and, and basically conquered or, or, or took that city to himself. So, um, uh, basically, what I want to say is that we have different groups, not just the Israelites. We have also non-Israelites that are part of the Israelite nation eventually. And that's probably also one reason, one more reason why we have the Mount Ibal Covenant that brings all these subgroups together and makes them one nation. Mm. Yes. Next question. Oh, oh, Wendy. question was, um, why did, uh, since their ancestors, why, uh, or family, why did they need to send spies in to the land? So be, before we talk about that, <laughs> let's talk about the idea, the possibility that Joshua bin Nun is Canaan born, that he's from, mm. from Canaan. So first of all, let's, let's I, I want to mention a few things. First of all, um, according to Chronicles, 
the whole story, the whole lineage of Ephraim uh, could be happening only in Canaan. And therefore, Joshua bin Nun is born in Canaan. Now, what was Joshua's name? No. What was his original name? Hosea. Very good. Hoshea. His name is Hosea. And the Bible says that Moses changes Hosea to Yehoshua. In other words, he adds the name of the Lord mm -hmm. from Mount Sinai to the leader that's going to lead the Israelites into the land of Israel. Now, did Moses just feel like doing that, or is there a certain purpose to it? So um, my theory is that because we were bringing a, a theology that was brought down in Sinai to the Egyptian Israelites, to Manasseh and Ephraim, the leader that's bringing the Israelites from Sinai has to carry the name of the Lord in his, in his name. Uh, it's a declaration saying, I believe in the Lord, YHW. Okay, that's, that's the, the idea behind it. Now, Joshua appears... The first place he appears is the battle with Amalek after the Israelites c come out of Egypt. This is where he, he appears. Uh, he doesn't appear in the whole story of Egypt. He doesn't, mm -hmm. he's not mentioned. Right. Um, so again, if we write and Joshua is Canaan, Canaanite born, we're starting to make up a story. Okay? And the story is everybody's hearing about the amazing miracles that are going on in Egypt, the Israelites, uh, not just the Ephraimites and the Menasites, but also the Canaanites. I mean, when the, Israel, when the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, when they're going into Jericho, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the lady that, that hosts the spies, she says, we heard what happened to you guys there. Right. We're, <laughs> we're trembling. Okay, this is, you know, it, there was an internet then, and no phones, no newspapers, but, but news, word got, right word got out, yes. So uh, the idea is that Joshua went from Canaan to meet the Israelites. Mm -hmm. Then his name was changed from Hosea to Yehoshua. Okay? And then, who is the best guy to lead the Israelites into Canaan, if not someone who knows the country? Okay? When the spies are sent in, who is, this, who, who is the spy or the spies that say, the land is good, let's go in? Mm -hmm. Joshua. Right. Okay, so suddenly you know, these things connect. Um, why was there a need to send spies into the land of Israel? Um, my, my personal view is that, the, the, that the, the, the Israelites were slaves, and they did not have the mentality of, uh, of, of, of fighters, right. of, of, of people who, who could right. go in and fight against the Canaanites and, and get, get the land. The only ones that could do it are, pe are free people like Joshua. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the people who are asking to send spies into the land of Israel are the skeptics. They are the tribes that came from Egypt who have an exilic mentality and, and they, they want to make sure that it's possible yeah. but actually looking for an excuse yeah. not to do it. Mm -hmm. That's also why maybe God like forced them to have like 40 years in the desert so the generations could be replaced by people that were never slaves. They were free, right? Right. Now, so that was number one. Second one is these footprints that you talk about, and you found this wonderful little tablet on one of them. Do you think each of those footprints has a little footprint of God, or something that as special as this tablet that you found? The second question has to do with the footprints and how special they are. And since uh, the tablet that was discussed last night uh, was found, you could say, in one of those on Mount Ebal, um, could it be that others, other, these other footprints may also have something like that? Um, again, this is my personal view. I have no speculative. idea. Speculative. Speculative, yeah. totally speculative. But, but I think that the answer is negative. I think that the, right. the tablet is connected to the ceremony of the blessings and the curses, and therefore it's unique to Mount Ebal. There might be a blessing tablet on Mount Gerizim, wherever that is, um, but uh, but I think that that those are the two only cases, only two cases where we have 
an actual tablet that of, of a blessing of a curse that is physically put in a place according to the Bible. The, the, um, the sites of the footprint structures um, were actually, I'm not talking about the one at Mount Eval specifically, but in general, they were places of, uh, of worship. And therefore what you would find is uh, cooking pots, uh, vessels that would carry offerings to, to God. Um, and, and, and most interestingly, again, the shape of it and the fact that, the fact that you have a procession road that shows that part of the practice there was to go around, to walk around, um, and um, you know, there, there, there are different different types of things, but <coughs> but so the end. This is this is the answer. Yes, one. Yeah, I agree. Oh. I agree. I yeah. totally agree. I think that if we get a, p a permission to excavate on Mount Eval, we'll find more things. Mm -hmm. um, again, like I said, we can't excavate Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem, Jebusite Jerusalem, or King David's Jerusalem. Uh, but if we could, we would find amazing stuff there. If Joshua's altar was the center of, I would say, the capital, kind of like the spiritual capital of the Israelites for 70 years, there is more written material there. Yeah. And if not on tablets, then on, on, you know, on, on pieces of clay, um, sure. maybe the plaster that's being analyzed, we're going to find yeah. something. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's limitless. But, uh, but I have to tell you, what we have right now, this tablet, is like, we say in Hebrew, Dayenu, enough. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> so much. Yeah. Questions? So every time he came to speak to our groups, um, I would present him as the born-again archaeologist. Uh, <laughs> and, and he would laugh. Uh, and, and every time he presented his discovery, uh, you always had that guy in the, in the, in, in the audience that said, and so are you a believer now? And, and so he always had the same answer. I'm more Jewish. That's what he <laughs> said. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Um, I think that that uh, when we talk about belief, um, as I said yesterday, we don't need evidence to believe in God. Okay, this is it's something that's that's part of us. It's 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 it's, it's an integral part of our being. Um, but there are some people, and it's hard for us believers to understand that there's some people who don't believe in God. It's not it's not part of their belief system, and so even if they find evidence, sure. It won't make them believers. It will just make them believe in the historicity of the events. So did Adam Zertal become a believer or not? I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I can say that if he did, he wouldn't say it for a number of reasons. One, he's living in a kibbutz where everybody's a non-believer. And they, they think he's crazy anyway for finding the altar and... And the second thing is, he is a professor of archaeology. If he says that he is a believer, right. he's, out. he's out. Okay, yeah. there's a reason why God chose an atheist professor who has no bias and no preconceptions to be the one to find Joshua's altar. Yeah. Did you have a, a follow up to yeah, that? Not to be the stereotypical American, but what is your thoughts on the Ark of the Covenant, right? I know that's kind of been really Hollywood, you know, kind of has made a big deal of it. So Jewish tradition believes that uh, Jeremiah hid the Ark of the Covenant mm -hmm. inside the Temple Mount, in caves inside the Temple Mount. Um, that's just a tradition. Uh, there are sources in, the, uh, in, in later, later, later Jewish sources that uh, hint about the specific area on Temple Mount where the Ark of the Covenant is and how dangerous it is to, to get close to it and how the priesthood at the Second Temple period actually... Got, uh, pe got people got killed because they tried to investigate. Um, when we talk about modern times, uh, have you been to Israel? So 
you have the uh, the western wall, which is a retaining wall of the Temple Mount. And uh, in the past, let's say, 30, 40 years, you have excavations of an, an area called the Western Wall Tunnels. It's very famous. And uh, one of the people that advocated for these um, excavations is, uh, is a, a famous rabbi in Israel. And he did that because he, it's not clear if it was a revelation or if it was a, an intuition that, that he is supposed to, to, to dig in there and get to the Ark of the Covenant. And so um, they, they, they did excavate. Uh, they, they, they discovered a gate that they didn't know existed. They broke into the gate. And just as they were, were about to enter the, the areas that were uncharted under Temple Mount, the Muslim waqf uh, discovered it. And uh, people from Temple, the, the upper, upper area of Temple Mount kind of like, you know, You've seen Mission Impossible, they, 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 you know, ropes go in, you have Muslims going down, you have this big commotion, and, and eventually the Israeli government poured cement, right. closed that gate, and it didn't continue. So the whole area of Temple Mount right now is, is very sensitive. So. But there's a reason for it. I mean, God, God will reveal it when we're ready. Yeah. Questions? So the Bible says that uh, Joseph was not happy, you know, that his father switched hands as far as Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, is there you know, a perspective on why, why he was unhappy? That's the question. Or why he switched hands? Well, yeah, that's, well, no, it's, it's interesting as to why he would do it. So, so uh, the, the theory is that because... Uh, there's a long tradition there, eh? Yeah. The theory is that because Joshua... Um, was from the tribe of Ephraim, uh, and he was supposed to be the leader of the Israelites crossing into the, to the land of Canaan. Jacob knew it prophet prophetically, and that is why he chose Ephraim over Manasseh, although Manasseh was the firstborn. Um, so that's, I think that's, that's the, the, the answer that everybody thinks. Uh, what is the real answer? I don't know. I think that, uh, remember the religious Jew that I talked about yesterday with Adam Zertal mm -hmm. that ran away and brought the, so he has another theory, and that is that um, the Mount Eval is in the tribal land of Manasseh. Okay, so Mount Eval becomes the central place of worship, but then it ceases to, to to be active, and it moves to Shiloh. Shiloh is already in the tribe of Ephraim. So again, we have another prophetic move here of Jacob, knowing that Ephraim will be leading the Israelites uh, in, in, in leadership and spirituality, and that's where the tabernacle is going to be. That's where, where God's presence is going to be. So that's another, another possibility. Um, also, I think that we have to also remember that, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had some problem with firstborns, and, and they always liked the younger ones. And so I'm, I wonder to myself, what was Jacob thinking when he was doing that? I mean, didn't you learn from the whole, but, uh, the whole trouble with Esau that you, if you start preferring the, the smaller one over the, young, over the older one? Uh, so maybe there's something there as well. Uh, and maybe Joseph didn't like that because he saw what it did to his older brothers and the, uh, the hatred that that caused. So he wanted, didn't want Jacob to continue that tradition of preferring the younger one. Um, so maybe that also has mm -hmm. something to it. Okay, other questions? I love thinking about these things. <laughs> Karen. The name of the Lord. That they would have to take the pen out after they wrote it, take a clothing, change robes, do a ceremony, wash, because 
they were not permitted to use the same thing. And I thought that sounded odd because I thought when you raised your hand, you had to do that. I'm thinking I must be just not understanding this. And you wouldn't say that word when you were reading it mm -hmm. on the screen. So could you just explain? So the question has to do with. Um, you know what, what a lot of people learn you know about uh, how the scribes uh, as they were transcribing you know or, or copying from a manuscript to uh, a new scroll and every time they would come to the divine name uh, to you know Yodhe Bhav Hey YHWH um, they would stop they would the, there was a process they would go through whether it was to wash hands or there's a lot of different steps that that people teach are involved in that and so, and you, you connected that, as I hear, with even not, not saying the name of the Lord, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, what I know from, from the tradition of, 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 you say, scribesmanship, <laughs> is that, what you, is that um, there, there, there are different traditions. I've heard of scribes that go and, and uh, do a ceremonial baptism before they write the holy name. Uh, I don't know if they do it before every name or at the, at the beginning of every day before they start writing uh, the the, uh, the scriptures on, on the parchments. Um, so that's that's something that I, I don't know how to answer. Uh, in terms of the, the holy name, um, I have to tell you that that's one of my big sorrows. Um, the fact that we are not able to pronounce the holy name um, that it's it's uh, believed to be disrespectful uh, in the Jewish uh, tradition to try and pronounce it. I remember as a kid, my, my my grandparents, my Egyptian grandparents, had the name of the Lord on on these, you know, these special pictures that they had with with you know with with um, with verses from the Bible. And I remember as a as a you know a five year old or no, not a five year old, I, I knew how to read, so it was probably second grade or third grade. I was looking at this name and I was trying to pronounce it, and they were like, "Shh, don't yeah. say it." Right. So I didn't even know how to say it. I just tried to read it, you know, like a, a child. Um, but um, I feel that that one of the things that we, as as, as I don't want to call ourselves Jews, Israelites, that mm -hmm. one of the things that we need to do as Israelites, uh, uh, part of our going back to our origin, to back going back to the the essence of, of the, the scriptures is to come back and pronounce the name. And um, I have to tell you, I, I went to, to Professor Yoda Litzur and I went to my, my rabbi in where I live and I told them that I want to I say the name. Um, I, I, I go to Christian churches and these pastors say the name freely. Scott Stripling says the name of Hashem on, on, that, uh, on that video. I want to say it too. And, 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 and suddenly I'm saying to myself, you know, we're saying the Shema, you know, hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. When the Israelites said that, they didn't say Adonai, they didn't use the, the other, other way we, we say the name, they used the name itself. Right. And I'm, I'm saying to myself, wow, if I say that with the name, that's, that's different. It's like, I call him in his name. It, I, 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 I suddenly become closer to him. So I, I, I really feel that urge to do that, but I don't have the guts. <laughs> I'm serious. I don't have the guts. So, so you know, maybe... Well, that's, that, this is a good topic. I know, I know. If I could, yeah. uh, for, for a moment. Because I've always been very interested in this, you know. Um, I remember taking Hebrew, and when I finally got my first my Hebrew Bible, and, and we were translating, and I came to the Shema. And in the Masoretic text, at least the way it is in... Um, in in my Hebrew Bible, uh, when you get to Shema Yisrael, it doesn't say Yehovah; it says Adonai, and 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 the the font is twice as big, of course. Um, I'd never seen that anywhere else in in the Tanakh. I said it to to my prof. I said, "What is this?" He goes, ah, "That's just what they do." <laughs> well, he wasn't he wasn't Jewish, you know. And um, I said, okay, I mean, he was a good Hebrew scholar, but he wasn't answering my question. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I've grown up with you know Jewish friends all my life, and so um, and some of them, when I was young, I I mean, I really offended a lot of Jewish families just because I was stupid, you know. And so uh, you know, whether you know eating cocoa puffs out of a milk dish or something, you know, um, and. Uh, I really got in trouble for that. Um, but 
I watched, you know, and I would listen to people how they 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 wouldn't say the name of the God, I, name of God. I didn't know who Hashem was until I took Hebrew and I realized, oh, I understand what it means now. Okay, the, the name. The name. Um, but uh, I guess what I'm getting at, I would see people write it, you know, G hyphen D, you know, L hyphen R D, that kind of thing. Where did this come from? Because you're right, they pronounced right, the name. Right. So what, do you, can you help us to understand where did this come from, this tradition? I think that uh, when you leave the land of Israel and you go to exile, um, you don't just uh, leave your homeland, you also get hit spiritually. Um, you go away from the land of Israel, from the holiness of the land of Israel. And also, Jewish tradition says that, that when the Israelites went to exile, the Shekhinah, the, the mm -hmm. God's, God's, uh, Shekhinah glory. Glory. God's, God's glory, God's presence also went to exile. And so I think that the idea is that we are not um, entitled, we're not in the spiritual degree to say the name when we're in exile. Um, we can only start saying it when we're back in the land of Israel and when exile is over. So, um, and, and, I, and I, I'm sometimes I, I wonder to myself if, if I'm the only guy in Israel who wants to say the name of yeah, the Lord or right. if there are others who are feeling like me, I kind of feel that it is something that might be in other people's hearts, but they're not talking about it. Yeah. Because I talk all the time. But, but um, so that's, I think that that's, that's my, well, what happened? Oh, I did like this. So that, I think that that's, I think that that's what, that's what, uh, what happens. There's also another issue here, and that is that we don't know how the name of the Lord is pronounced. Right. Um, now, is that because we've forgotten it, uh, because of the exile? Um, I don't know. I, again, I went to Professor Yola Litsur in my town and I asked him, how do you say the name? And he's like, I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, you know, that there is a discussion about it in the Jewish books and they say that it sounds like Joseph, like Yosef, hmm. and that the Vav is not a Vav, it's a Wa. So he actually yeah. believes yeah, like, wow. like, yeah. yeah. So, but, but again, it's like we have this thing that is stopping us from saying it and it, it's something that God has to, to lift. It's this, we have scales on our hearts. We almost want to think, I you know, and I, I don't know, I'm just saying this, but uh, because you're not in exile now, right? right. You're, you're back in the land. And not all Israel, but, you know, you're back in the land. Um, and, you know, the dry bones are living. Now, the Ruach HaKodesh has not, you know, come upon the people yet. But nevertheless, the dry bones live. Right. So could it be, because I, I think your suspicion is right, that there must be many more in Israel who are dying to say the name. Right. What would happen? It wouldn't be, uh, the, the earth's not going to open and you're going to go down you know, into it, but rather would it not possibly then be the beginning of the revival exactly. of Israel? I, I agree. It's going to be part of it. And, uh, and I think we are, you know, a lady asked me yesterday, what's the spirit in Israel? What's going on in Israel now? Is it like the United States where, you know, you feel like spirituality is, is starting to diminish? And, 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 I, and I told her that, that in Israel, I feel that there is a revival, but it's not, it's, it's a natural revival. It's not, uh, it's not, you know, people in the streets, you know, handing out tracts. It's, it's something that, that people, and, and, and it's not, connected to Jewish practice. It's not something that, it's, 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 it comes from the inside. Uh, people start to connect themselves to, to mm -hmm. God, to the land of Israel, to the Jewish people, and you start seeing it. The first place you see it is arts. You start, you know, s singers are, 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 <laughs> are singing spiritual songs. They're yeah. talking about God. They're talking about their, their hardships and their... their their, um, I don't know how to say it in, in English, um, their hesitations, 
um, about their, you know, about even educating their children. They have a, a singer called uh, Hanan Ben Ari, and he speaks about he's praying to God in the song that he will not, uh, in, he will not inherit his traumas or his uh, craziness to his children. That they will grow innocent and and these are songs that didn't exist when I was yeah. a kid. Okay, this is like it's totally new. And, uh, and, and, and I think that it's, it's spreading in Israel. I think that people were, were becoming more spiritual. Um, yeah, there are a lot of things that are happening in Israel. It's very yeah. exciting. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I want us to stay on our, our general topic yeah. tonight. But this is, no, but this is a good mm -hmm. thing. And I, I would just say this, to, uh, to add to you know, your observation about how there's this surge that's beginning. Um, and it's... And in some ways, it's across generations. But in many ways, at least from our observation going over there, some of the work that we've done, some of our work groups, uh, some of the, the, uh, the, the experiences we've had in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv so is very... T for the, those of you not familiar, you know, everybody talks about Jerusalem, you know, holy city, all that, and it is. It's the city of the great king, right? Um, and there are pockets in Israel that are quite religious, you know. Uh, certainly Ofra is a prime example of that, um, where Aaron lives. Um, up in, uh, as you get into Tiberias, for example, you know, there's a, uh, in fact, uh, is it not the, the seat of the Sanhedrin now? Um, which started in, what, 20, 2007 or something like that. Um, so you've, you've got this, this resurgence of of Judaism in that regard, right? Uh, but you also have um, this move among, and in a lot of ways, younger people. You know, the, the Gen Xers and the Millennials, who, you know, if you think about it for a minute, you have these generations who've come in, right? So you have the generation who were the pioneers. They're old now, right? But they, they came in and before 48, but especially from 48 forward. Um, whether they made, you know, Aliyah, like, like Avi Lipkin, you know, from Long Island of all places, um, or, uh, but especially those who came, came out of Europe after the Holocaust and all that, you know, powerful stories. These are the pioneers. These are the, this, talk about the builder generation. This is the builder generation. And you put someone like that next to, a, you know, an American Jew, and there's this real lack of understanding for one another. You know, the, 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 the one in Israel is saying, you know, you, you just, you're wealthy, you only care about your comforts, you know nothing about the homeland. And, you know, the person, the American Jew is saying, you know, you think you're all that because you're a pioneer. And the, they just don't understand one another. And then you get this next generation, call them the boomers in a sense, you know, um, who come in and they're, they're, they're part of the building now of, you know, as, it, as, as Israel industrializes and big apartment buildings and that sort of thing. Um, and then you get into now that the, the, the Gen Z, well, I, I should say, I, you, know, you know, the people who are like 50 years old and now as, as you get into the millennials and the Xers, um, it's a very interesting group who, you know, our observation is that it's that younger generation, especially the people in their teens and 20s, we're saying, I don't understand all the religion of my grandparents. Just like I went through, I was an atheist. I didn't understand the religion, it meant nothing to me. But when I heard I could have a relationship with God, there was something there. You've experienced that yourself, it's obvious. You know, you have a love for God. Mm -hmm. You know, as opposed to many Jewish people I've met who, they know Talmud, you know, and they know what to do, but they don't have a, a love for the right. Word of God, right? Um, and, and there's an interesting phenomenon that some of you may know and some may not. Um, Eitan Bar, do you know Eitan Bar? Interesting fella who's, uh, he's got a doctor now, doctorate, but um, One for Israel is his organization. And, and he's, he's, he's provided an opportunity for the younger generation to ask questions that are not happening in this format, but rather on their cell phone. And they watch, they watch videos. In other words, they're getting answers to questions about the Bible. So, and, and answers to many things that they may not feel they're getting the, uh, an answer they 
appreciate from their rabbi much the same way I did when I was a teenager. I didn't, I didn't understand what that minister was telling me. Um, and they're asking questions about Yeshua, and they're watching videos, and they're getting answers that way. So I, I say that because there's this movement, and it's happening in many ways throughout the world. Because, and you guys, you've heard me say it many times, but when you look at revolutions in the world and you look at, you know, any kind of big changes, it's always the younger generation. They've got the energy, they have vision for change. So there's something that's stirring. It's an interesting thing that's happening. People are looking for, for truth. So, anyway, I think, I, think no, I, I totally agree with you. And, and I think that, uh, I think that one, of the, one of the things that what we're seeing is that you know, the, the pioneers, the people that, that, uh, that established Israel, you know, they, they, they made themselves suffer to advance Israel. And now that Israel is this flourishing uh, Middle Eastern empire, <laughs> so <laughs> to say, um, suddenly uh, there's no need to, to be tough. Now, some people say that, that that's not good. Uh, my mm -hmm. son, for example, he believes that you need to be tough, that you need to, to fight, you need to be a fighter. Well, uh, Middle East. it's the Middle East. <laughs> no, but, it's, you better be but, ready. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, I have a daughter, uh, his, his, his younger daughter. She's two years younger than him. And she is totally different. She's this sensitive being. She's so sensitive. It's amazing. She, she gets everything like this. She's like... And, um, and she's not a fighter. Um, and, and I think that, 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 that what I'm seeing in her and, and in other, other, other children from her generation is that they, are, they don't feel the need to be a fighter. And so what they're doing is they're concentrating their energy on being truthful, on being, being who they are, being, being connected to, to what they see as sincere and what they see is uh, they see as not hypocritical and and i think that that's another stage in in the process that we're in in israel that will eventually lead to our uh, uh, renewal of the covenant with god mm -hmm. and w which will first and foremost be believe it or not the renewal of prophecy mm. um, i think that this is the this is our goal uh, and and we're st we're starting to see more and more of that being spoken about in Israel. Uh, when we read the Bible, we see that the the columns of the Israelite nations are the the king, the judge, the high priest, but also the prophet. Yeah. And and the the prophet is 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 God's way of talking to us. The whole Bible is a book of prophecy. Yet, if I stand today in downtown Jerusalem and I say that God speaks to me, an ambulance will come and take me. Uh, and and, 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 and when, when I talk about prophecy in Israel, um, you see the older generation, very skeptic, very cynical, you know. But the younger generation, you know, is, is sensitive now. They're, they're, they're attentive. You, you, need to be sens you need to be sensitive to be attentive. Mm -hmm. And when you're, when you're a fighter, you have your target, that's what you're not sensitive. So I think that, that that's, that's preparing us for the next stage where the Bible says that God will outpour His Spirit all over the earth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I hope that that starts in the land of Israel. That's where it's going to come from out to the whole world. So I'm really excited. And sometimes sensitivity to God comes when you find out you can't win every battle. You know, so, you know, you, you can win the War of Independence, you can win the Sinai, you know, campaigns, you can win the 67, you know, you, you can win these things, and of course, God's behind it all, but you can see your own effort in it. But if there comes a point, and the scripture says it's coming, you know, in, we were talking yesterday, and, you know, Gog and Magog, um, there's coming a time where the IDF's not gonna hack this, and it's gonna be a clear outpouring of God's power. Right. You know, and that, I believe that's when Israel, in one sense, is going to come to their knees, at least initially, and then um, probably go on CNN and say, now you gotta deal with us <laughs> to the world, you know? Uh, <laughs> sensitive and strong. So, uh, let's do a couple more questions, okay? And then, uh,
that is Bachel dump site compared to other archaeological dump sites. How clean would you say it was? Scott said that uh, the question we was the question. how does Adams or Tell's dump site compare to other dump sites? How clean was it? So Scott says that Adams or Tell did a good job. My uh, wife, my wife yeah. says all the time, when you speak to groups, no, that's her, that's my son, my son says it. He says, Dad, when you talk to the groups, uh, try to emphasize how many things could have happened that, that would have caused yeah. us not to, found, right. not to find the right. lead the tablet. Yeah. You know, just to give an example, one of the people that are extracting this could have like, yeah. you know, it's like so many things could have happened. The army could have told us to stop just a few seconds before we actually took it out of the dump, and so that I, you know, that I yeah. agree. You had a f another question, My right? My next one was, how would you describe Adam Gartel believing with every bone in his body that death was not evil when everyone else was denying it? And I'm specifically speaking about his physical form. I, I, I heard parts of that. So how would you describe Adam Zertal believing with all? Every bone in his body. Oh, that believing with every bone in his body that that was Mount Evil, uh, compared to you know, all of the crowds who believed otherwise. The, the community, the, the academic community. He believed in it so much that he tried to change the geography. <laughs> I mean, uh, one, of the th one of the problems is you can't see Mount, you can't see Mount Gerizim from the site of the altar. And the ceremony says that you had the two, the two tribes, you know, and, and Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal ha were, were an integral part of the ceremony. And so Zertal basically said that the Mount Gerizim of the Samaritans is not the real mountain, and it has to be Mount Kabir on the other side. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he, he believed it so much that, that he actually tried to, to change the geographic reality and the traditions to fit the altar on Mount Ebal. That's how much he, he believed in it. Um, I think that that he, he because he believed in it so much, it caused him so much sorrow to see that the world that he belonged to, the academic world, uh, is is failing to acknowledge it, and and he was he had such sadness in him that uh, that he was uh, humiliated and. Uh, you know, just just after the press conference, I made a video and I put it on YouTube. And I said that now, after the discovery of this tablet, there has to be a line of professors that are going to go to Adam Zertal's tomb, kneel, and ask for his forgiveness because of what they did to him. If only. Yeah. So the whole issue. Okay, want to repeat that? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, because I often mention the Temple Institute, which also has a different name. I always call it the Institute, but mm -hmm. it has a different name. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess the question was. Is that well accepted throughout Israel um, in terms of the work that they're doing and that sort of thing? And, and you know, I'm interested in your perspective. I, I used to say that certainly earlier on when I was more involved bringing tours and that sort of thing, um, uh, you know, and the Temple Institute's an interesting place. Anybody who's traveled with us, you know, I always say to the groups when you go, uh, you're going to hear some interesting stories that you're going to be looking at me and saying, how can they believe that? Um, just, you know, just be patient and be nice, and you know, um, we'll work through it. Um, but uh, the whole idea of the Third Temple uh, is an idea that at one time was, a, I want to be careful to say, an embarrassment. But from the government's perspective, it was like, just don't, don't talk to us about that right now. So, uh, and I think that's part of what you're getting at. How, how well accepted is that idea of the Third Temple at this point? Because I would say that, from my experience, that's shifting, but you're on the ground. In uh, 1967, the Six-Day War, Israel liberated <laughs> uh, the, the, the Jerusalem, the old city. And, you know, the chief rabbi of uh, the army was so excited, he went up to Temple Mount, and he's like, okay, let's build the temple. And he sees all the soldiers leaving Temple Mount and going to the Western Wall to pray there. And he doesn't understand what's going on. I mean, we're at Temple Mount. Why are you going to the Western Wall? And so I'm, I'm saying that because, uh, and then 
And then the second thing that happened was that uh, the next day, after the liberation of, of the Temple Mount, our uh, Minister of Defense, Moshe Dayan, came to the walk for the Islamic uh, right. a, a religious institutions that are in charge of Temple Mount, and he gave them the keys that they gave him the day before, and tells them, this area is yours, it's not ours. He was considered a traitor by a lot of people. And they, yeah. asked, him, they asked him why you did that, and he said, well, we don't need the Vatican. We don't need another Vatican. Because he was an atheist, secular Jew, and he didn't see religion and the temple as something that was positive. It was primitive, it was of the past. When I was in the 1980s, when I was a kid, there was the, a guy called Gershon Salomon. Oh, man. Good yeah. friend of our family. And he was, uh, <laughs> he was a part of a small group that wanted to build a temple. And they would go every year with, a, with, you know, with, with animals to sacrifice, and the police would catch them and would... And they'd set a cornerstone yeah. up but there. But everybody, everybody <laughs> thought, everybody, including yours, yours truly, thought they're crazy. Okay? No Jews in the 1980s or 90s, visit, religious Jews, visited the Temple Mount out of religious reasons. If you go today, it's 2022, if you go today to the Western Wall, you'll see you know, the, the, the thousands going to the Western Wall, but you'll also see a very long line of Jews that are going and are standing to go up to Temple yeah. Mount for religious reasons. Um, including yours truly. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there is, there's definitely a, a move towards acknowledging Temple Mount as the, the holy place and not the Western Wall. And, you know, my son and I get into a lot of trouble when we say that, because we, uh, seriously, when you go up the bridge up to Temple Mount and you look at the Western Wall and the people praying there, and then you're, you're passing that and you're going into mm -hmm. the holy area, you kind of get it. It's just a retaining wall. Right. It's not the holy place. The reason why people are standing there and are facing a certain direction is because that's where the holy of holy is. That's right. where you need to get to. That's the, that's the holy place. So, um, so I think that that's also changing. And uh, you know, every every year we see record numbers of Jews going up to Temple Mount, contrary to many rabbinical uh, rulings against it. Right. Uh, people are saying, first of all, there are rabbis that are permitting it, and B, this is real. This is, people are looking for, for, the, for the truth, like you said. They're looking for the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, again, when the Temple Institute started working, it was this place of crazy people. Now it's like a, a mandatory place to visit when you go to the Jewish quarter in the old city. Um, and so it's kind of like in the consensus, uh, at least of the religious world. Because the religious world believes that the temple should be rebuilt. Uh, the question is how, when, uh, what situation should be around for it to, be ha to happen. These are all questions that are in dispute inside religious Judaism. When you go to traditional Jews and secular Jews, it's still something that's not... You know, a friend of mine and I stood once, he's secular, and, and he, we looked at Temple Mount and he said to me, can you believe that there are people that want to build a temple here? <laughs> By the way, he's a Kohen, he's a priest. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you believe that? I mean, and I looked at him like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But and like the second question is, how would that temple look like? What would it be? Uh, what would the, the role of that temple be? How is Messiah connected to it? Uh, these are all questions that uh, that uh, we're, we're dealing with for the first time, but in reality, not in theory. Uh, right. After 2,000 years of, uh, of the destruction of the, the, the last temple, and we believe we believe and we hope that this is not going to be destroyed anymore. That this is mm -hmm. going to be the, 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 the house of nation, a house of prayer for all nations, as Isaiah says, mm -hmm. um, not just a place of worship for the Jews. Yeah. And it will be. Well, yeah. Certainly, Daniel tells us something's going to happen between now and then. You know, it's going to be defiled. That third temple will be defiled. You know, because the great world leader is going to.
prop himself up in the holy place, mm -hmm. in the holy of the holies, declaring himself to be God. Um, so it will be defiled, the abomination of desolation. Um, but there's a cleanup campaign after that. <laughs> so another question. You're always going to get good stuff out of this guy. Uh, yeah, not that anybody else's wasn't, but. I have two, if I may. Aaron, why are the footprint structures made like that? Where does that come from? Okay, uh, this question was also asked yesterday. The footprint that? structure, why is it designed the way it is? Where does that concept yeah. come from? So, um, okay, so I have to give an answer now. Um, Zertal found the archaeological find, and then what he does is he goes to the Bible and he's looking for feet in the Bible, and he basically classifies four categories of the importance of the foot structure, the, the foot symbol. One is conquest. Um, Moses, God says to, to, to the Israelites, everywhere you will tread your foot will be yours, from the Lebanon to the desert. So the foot has a, a clear um, a symbolism of, of conquest, of, of uh, conquering a land and making it yours. Um, the foot is also the existence of a people. Uh, there are verses in the Bible that say that God will not take the foot of the Israelites out of the land. So it's the existence, not just the conquest. Um, the foot is also the, the foot of God. In other words, the, it says in Ezekiel that the temple is the footstool of God. Um, uh, and so th these are the three of the, the, three of the, the uh, uh, symbols of the foot. There's a fourth one. I, I don't remember it right now. Maybe I'll remember it later. Um, another thing that Zertal says is that this is clear Egyptian influence on Israelite thinking. Now, this is something that might be a bit uh, hard for us to, uh, to, uh, um, to understand or to, to agree with as Bible believers, but um, the Jewish tradition says that because the Israelites were in Egypt for centuries, uh, they were, it, it, it's literally swamped in Egyptian culture. Um, by the way, uh, one of the one of my teachings on my YouTube channels is, is to show to prove that the Book of Exodus and 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 Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy were written at the time that they are describing, because the five books of Moses are filled with Egyptian symbolism and Egyptian culture. Mm -hmm. I'll just give you an example. If you meet someone by the name of Boris on the street, what do you know about him? He's Russian, right? Well, I have, I have a newsflash for you. Aaron, Moses, Phineas, Tsipora are Egyptian names. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Surprise. Yeah. And, and it's not, and it's not, again, it's not surprising. I mean, I mean, the, we were in Egypt for centuries. Uh, another, another example that I have for you, it's quite mind-blowing, is there's a commandment for the Israelites to put tefillin. You know what tefillin is? Yeah. Phylacteries? So um, the, the commandment is to put a phylactery on the hand and a phylactery on the, on the head. The phylactery on the head is called totafot in Hebrew. But there's no word like that in Hebrew. Totafot is not a Hebrew word. Even the Jewish sages acknowledge it in the interpretations. So what do you do? You look for this word in another place, and you find out that totafot in Egyptian means the crown of Pharaoh. You know that Pharaoh has a snake here. Uh, if you look at the uh, crown of uh, Tut Anak Amun, uh, one of the pharaohs of Egypt, you actually see that he has the, the crown and a, and a strip here and two strips coming down here, exactly like my phylacteries and any Jewish phylactery. Mm. So what's the story here? Why are we putting phylacteries? The Bible says you put phylacteries to remember the Exodus, to remember coming out of Egypt. Mm. Okay? So when we're putting this, we're remembering Egypt. We're remembering what, what happened in Egypt. And we're also putting, our, putting on our head the crown of Pharaoh to show that we are free, that mm. we, are, we are like Pharaoh. We're, we're, we're the kings now. Mm. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. Now, Totafot, the word Totafot, DDFT, is Egyptian. 
So there's so much uh, in that. And so Zertal, when he talks about the footprint structures, he goes into Egypt and he sees that the foot of Pharaoh is not just a physical foot. When you look at the, at the temples, you see Pharaoh putting his legs on captives. Um, the, the sandals of, of, the, of Pharaoh, Tutankhamun, have the seven bows on the sandal. Right. So every time that Pharaoh would step on his sandals, he's spiritually showing his rule over the people. And so the, the Israelites are coming into the land of Israel. God is not Pharaoh. God is Hashem. And, and his, these feet are his feet. And, and, and so it's his existence in the land, but it's also their um, a, a victory over the Canaanite nations. Mm. And I also added yesterday that I believe that because Jacob, the name Jacob, Yaakov, comes from mm -hmm. the act of s holding Esau's heel. Right. Yes. Okay, so in other words, Yaakov is the foot. Right. <laughs> and so we are the, the people of the foot. We're, we're the Bnei Yaakov, we're the, the descendants of Jacob. Yeah. So here's another interesting, interesting twist to it. You had, you had one final one, and then we're going to wrap it. I so. do. In light of our temple discussion just a little while ago, is there any credible evidence? that Solomon had the first temple built in the city of David rather than what the Temple Mount is today? The question has to do with um, the existence and a, a common thing that's being, or common, a, a contemporary discussion as to, you know, where the temple really was. Uh, was it, it was Solomon, beginning with Solomon, was, was, was Solomon's temple on what we would consider to be the Temple Mount today, or was it built in another place? And most commonly, that tends to be city of David. Um, so, so there, there is a, 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 a person by the name of Bob Kornuk, I think is right. his name, yeah. um, who ha in, the f in the past, uh, I'd say, 10 years, um, mm. yeah. claimed that he believes that the temple is not on, on, on today's Temple Mount, but is actually outside of the old city in the area of the city of David. Um, what do I think about it? I, I, I personally disagree. I think that the temple is on Temple Mount. Um, the, the problem is that we're, we're just theorizing here because we can't, we can't excavate on Temple Mount. So how can we, how can we even check <coughs> the possibility of it? So all we have is tradition. And according to tradition, um, the temple was on Temple Mount, not, not outside of the old city. And believe me, Jews kept that tradition very, very zealously. I mean, I mean everywhere we are, you know, we, my son and I are here for already a month. We checked in and checked out of hotels like 10 times. And every hotel has a different direction. So when I pray, I need to take my phone <laughs> when with the compass, <laughs> find east. And that's where I know, you know, that's, right. that's, that's how I, so, so we're really zealous about it. And, uh, and Jews were in Jerusalem, you know, for th thousands of years. And, uh, and, and they knew where the, where the temple was and they kept that tradition. So I follow that tradition and uh, hope I'm right. <laughs> right. Thank you. Well, how about, can we ask that offline? Yeah, or is it, is it a quickie? Okay. I just want to thank you. I mean, I'm sure you get, I've been with you enough to hear your excitement. And, um, and I've listened to you, and you definitely have a very um, unique and a blessed way of teaching. And I know, you know, we consider Thank you. Families, yes. It's a, it's a high calling, and uh, just keep stepping into it. Thank you. Like yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. And, you know, I, we all joking aside, you know, I talk about, you know, how humble you are with a pumpkin on your head. But, um, <laughs> but seriously, that's uh, part of the reason I love you, because you are humble. Um, and, uh, 
And I know. By, and I by know, that, yeah, I know. I know you're, and proud of it, too. Uh, <laughs> but by that, I mean uh, about the pursuit of truth, you know. I'm going to rip that cape out right oh, off your head, you know. It hurts. <laughs> Um, and I and I appreciate you know how God has used you here, and I'm sure He's been doing that in throughout your trip. Um, I remember uh, sitting with your mom and dad in an Aroma Cafe. Somewhat, and if you haven't been there, you got to go to Israel because um, you'll never drink Starbucks again. Um, uh, but uh, and your dad is your dad, but uh, your mom was just saying, you know, and, and this is a woman who translated Arabic broadcasts for I don't know how many years for, you know, for the government. Um, and she just was saying, Christians need to read their Bibles. You know, and, and that, that kind of started there tonight, that here we are, we're people who we believe our Bible, we say we believe our Bibles, I'm not saying you don't, but we say we believe our Bibles, but the, the danger in that sometimes is that we can rest in the, in the slang that comes off our lips, of course I'm a Bible-believing Christian, you know, but you have to read it and follow it. Right. You know, not just throw information into your brain, but actually the, the evidence that we believe it is that we follow it. You know, the whole idea of you know, the halakha, you know, the, that in, to walk in Judaism, the, the walk, you yeah. know. Um, we call it the Christian walk. That, that comes out of, you know, the Jewish roots of our faith. Um, but we really need to be more serious about our, our halak, our halakha, you know, uh, we need to be more serious about that because that's the evidence that we believe the word of God. And, and so in that I say, uh, I really appreciate the way God has used you here, you know, in these last couple of days. Um, we hope you'll come back, not in two years, but like a lot sooner than that. <laughs> um, and uh, Lord willing, we're going to have a chance, you know, well, certainly some of us are going to have a chance to get together with you, but I'd like it to be, you know, on a tour, you know, that would be really great. So, um, why don't we all stand and let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you, Lord, for uh, what you've been doing these last couple of nights. Lord, it's always a blessing when we can come together and we can worship. Lord, we can sing the songs of the faith. Lord, um, we can come out of our crazy routines of our day and just come aside and to spend time with you, um, to hear the word of God taught, and to have fellowship with one another, Lord. Um, and it's been a special blessing, Lord, to have Aaron and Evitar here. Lord, um, you're doing a work in their lives, and you're using them, Lord, obviously, in a very powerful way. Um, in, I, I don't see what's happening in Israel, but I know that you have your hand on Aaron and, and the whole Lipkin tour, I'll call it a ministry, because that's what it is, Lord. So, Lord, we pray that you would just continue to direct this. And, and, and it's our prayer that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on Aaron, that you would continue to direct this man who has a soft heart for God, a soft heart for your word, Lord, that you would continue to draw him to yourself in a very special way and that you would reveal to him what your name really is. Not just to be able to say it, but yet that's so rooted in the, in, in the personality, in your personality, in your name, Lord. And so, Lord, even in his private time, Lord, as he comes to you and says, Lord, I just want to say your name between you and me right now, because you invite him into a mouth-to-mouth -mouth relationship, just as you invite each one of us. And Lord, that as he grows deeper, in his personal faith in you, in Jehovah God, Lord, and in that, that he would come to know the fullness of the Godhead. And in that regard, through your son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord, we thank you for his boldness and his desire to come uh, among the Christians in America, Lord. And we pray that as much as we come to become more familiar and loving of the Jewish roots of our faith, Lord, uh, that even in that, that you would draw us together, the Hebrew 
and the Christian side as one, Lord. Ultimately, I believe that is completely your will and your desire. And one day, Lord, we will not only share the mezzanine together, but, Lord, um, the New Jerusalem. And so, Lord, um, continue to pour out your spirit on them as they travel. Give them, obviously, safety, but also, Lord, power, strength, and wisdom to be able to teach for every single personality of every synagogue and church that they come across as they travel through our land, Lord, and give them safe travels as they, as they get home soon to be with family uh, and to eat good food again. <laughs> Lord, we love you, and we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you, brother. Thank you.